What's up everybody? Welcome back to the channel. We've got another three rotor RX-7 video for you guys today. We're gonna to be showing you guys all the progress that Martin's been making on this car. So let's get right to it. So in this video, I'm going to start off by showing you guys some of the exhaust work that Martin's done recently. Um, we're also going to be working on the downpipe for the car, and then after that we're actually going to be figuring out some stuff for the engine so we can properly time it. Let's get right to it. So from the last time you guys saw the header, Martin has got it fully mounted up here with the turbo on and has finished the pipe for the wastegate. So the wastegate pipe is there. There is a 60 millimeter teal wastegate and then the wastegate pipe comes off of that. You can see the flex joint on it there. The wastegate is going to be recirculated back into the exhaust through the downpipe that comes off of the turbo and goes down to the rest of the exhaust. So this is underneath the car. This is the tile 60 millimeter wastegate. And like I told you guys, we're going to what's called recirculate this right back into the rest of the exhaust. Um, the biggest reason to do this is to keep the wastegate from being too loud. A lot of the time if you have an open wastegate, once you go on throttle and have the boost come on, it'll actually be pretty loud. So if you recirculate it, it goes through the muffler just like the rest of the exhaust and it keeps it much quieter for street driving. So Martin's making this pipe and it's gonna go right here into the side of the downpipe and then run back to the car and through the exhaust. So Martin is marking the hole that he needs to cut on the downpipe. He'll probably take the downpipe back off, cut that hole and then weld these two pipes together and make the merge. Okay. Martin has marked his hole. And you can see he has an inside line. What he's going to do is going to use his cutoff wheel to cut that inside hole and then use Dremel tools to match the hole to the outside dimensions that he needs. And then he should be able to weld it up and make it look all good. So Martin got the hole cut and is now going to weld that pipe together. Uh, it's best that he welds it on the car to make sure that it fits together. Got everything welded up. The downpipe is pretty much finished. And now we can run that to the rest of the exhaust down here with the muffler on it. Now this car is using three and a half inch tubing on the downpipe and the entire rest to the exhaust system as well. Um, typically with a rotary, you wanna run kind of a bigger pipe because there's so much exhaust pressure with a rotary engine more than you would get from an equivalent piston engine. So you wanna have a really big exhaust and allow there to be a lot of airflow. Um, and that works out really well for rotary. So for example, Martin's two rotor that's in his FC has three and a half inch. Um, you could actually use four inch on a three rotor like this, but uh, with four inch, you run into the problem of it being so big that it's hard to fit underneath the car. You can't you know, fit it in between things. You have to go under and then it's the lower point of the car. So we think this three and a half will work really good, um, especially for a street car like this. So yeah, we got the downpipe finished and uh, we're getting that bolted up. We've got V-band here and then there's a V-band up on the wastegate pipe. Comes off the wastegate, that's what Martin's tightening up right now. So now that we're done with the downpipe and the wastegate recirculation pipe, we can move back to the front of the car. We're gonna be figuring out the timing for this engine so that we can properly tune it once the car is running. Let's do it. I've made a temporary pointer here Okay, and so what we need to do is using our pointer, we are going to mark the center of the apex seal 
in all three of our trailing spark plug holes and then all three of our leading spark plug holes. And what we have to do is we have to divide the difference between the trailing center and the leading center. And at that point on each one of those rotors, our rotor will be bottom dead center. We then can use the degree of these pointers, the actual teeth here, are six degrees apart because they're spaced at a 60 degree, a 60 tooth spacing. So that 60 tooth spacing means that divided by 360 degrees, we have six degrees between each one of these teeth. And the fact that the teeth is the same width as the gap that allows us to actually do a plus or minus about one degree, one and a half degrees. So anyway, what we're gonna do is we're gonna mark this and we're going to mark the trailing and leading for each of the three separate rotors. Those are gonna be 120 degrees apart from each other. And then what we're gonna do is once we have the divided, we'll then count the number of teeth to go 180 degrees from our position one and that'll give us the top dead center for that rotor. Okay, stop. Now, would you, well, you went too far. Go back. You didn't make a mark on this thing? Not yet. Go back, go back. You can see it, see? Good, see. There it is, see it? Now we want that in the center, there. That's kind of the center of the hole, wouldn't you say? Yeah. All right, so now we need to mark it. Okay, so now what we need to do is count 20 teeth from this position and move it 20 teeth and then we'll be able to um, find the apex seal on the number two housing. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So that's going to be 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20. So it needs to be this one right here. And it should show up right here. It should be about there now in the next, in the next housing. And we'll find it. That's the number two housing. Go to the number three housing. Let's see the number three housing. Okay, so it's definitely one, two. It's definitely not one, three. See that one? We're looking at the middle of the combustion chamber in that one. If you go back to the other one, you can see that's the middle. Yeah, of yeah, the middle of the, yeah. See that? 18, 19, and 20. Pull into that tooth. Put our tool back in. And we should be pretty close to seeing it on. There it is. Uh, right there. Boom. And then let's go back and forth and get just right. I'd say that's the center. Would you say that's the center? No, that's a little bit below. It's pulling. Right, it, it, that's a little too above. Right, right there. there, right there. Okay. All right. This motor was built by Chip Motorsports. You can see that by looking at all these machine work. Um, we actually don't, Steve and I don't know too much about this motor, so we are manually finding out what the top dead center is and what the firing order is on this motor. And um, when we're looking at it through the spark plug hole, we notice that this engine has a low compression rotor so you can look at it like this and that's how we were uh, checking the top dead center earlier but i noticed that the rotors have a cast finished bathtub that's what they call on the surface of the rotor and that's off of a early model fc turbo engine which has a lower compression rotor one of the lowest, it's not the lowest that the uh, Mazda made, but I think one of the lowest uh, compression rotor. So it so. has an unmachined <clears throat> combustion chamber. Exactly, unmachined. And then the later model turbo rotors have machined, you know, combustion chamber.
So all of this really means for us uh, with this build is that this means when we finish this car and actually are running the car, we'll probably have to run a little bit more boost to kind of achieve the same levels of power that we would have if it was a little bit higher compression if they'd used, you know, uh, later uh, the machined bathtubs and a higher compression engine. You could run lower boost and just have E85 in it and be able to run it fine. But we'll probably run a bit more boost and kind of get the same level of power that we were going to anyways. All right, so everything goes on this mark here. Okay, and this is trailing one, and this is leading one. So this mark here is leading one, and this mark here is trailing one. Now, this is 22 teeth and one third. It ends up coming out to being 129 degrees for the 21 and a half teeth, plus four and a half degrees which equals 133. Now, if we divide that in half to split the difference between the apex seal in trailing one and trailing two, we end up with dividing this in half. Okay, and then we're going to divide that by six degrees for each teeth. So that ends up being 11 0.125 teeth that we need to go from trailing one towards trailing two, which will be about here. And then we are going to be directly offsetting that by adding 30 teeth. Uh, no, actually what we're gonna do is we're gonna take away the 11 teeth that goes from here and then subtract so we need to go 30 teeth from here to there. So we need to take 30 teeth, subtract the 11 and an eighth teeth. Okay, so 30 minus 11.125 is gonna be 18 and seven eighth teeth from this in this direction. So I counted these out, 15, 16, 17, 18. Okay, and so like this edge right here, not all the way in the center, but just a little bit to the center. So in other words, right there, it's going to be top dead center. And so here we have the edge of the bathtub in uh, the lead on the leading and then here we have the edge of the bathtub and the trailing now if you would go together that puts it right about there and given that our apex um, seals are far more accurate than the actual combustion chamber is I'm gonna go with that definitely our top dead center right there so when this mark right here is top dead center, and this is trailing three, so we don't need to worry about that. So top dead center on cylinder one, and you can see that we're basically in the center of the combustion chamber, and you should be able to see the combustion chamber on both leading and trailing. If you see, there's a combustion chamber. Yeah. So it's in the combustion chamber on both. They're both passed. Yeah. So that should be top dead center for our number one rotor, 100%. So we're going to go ahead and mark top dead center on the pulley itself. So the reason we are marking it is so we can take that front part off and reposition it so that we have the gap here within 120 degrees. We can have this gap here within 120 degrees of top dead center. The reason we want that is so when we actually run the engine computer and are trying to time this, um, it has to be within 100 and <clears throat> 120 degrees so that it's closer to top dead center of cylinder, oh, cylinder rotor one. one. So that it's closer to top dead center of rotor one instead of rotor two or three. Um, that's the best way to set it up. So we're, we're going to move this uh, 90 degrees and have it here. Um, or we could have it at the bottom, but we don't want it too close either. So this position here should be just fine. So we've got all of the timing stuff done for today. And now Martin is putting the radiator back on. While we were doing that, Martin 
finished up welding some of the stuff onto the radiator. So he's got this top aluminum tubing that he welded on here that'll run to there and go into this swirl tank that he made. You guys can see that he welded the swirl tank right onto the side of this billet water manifold that we showed you guys earlier. So now that that's done, we've got this line that goes here. We'll, we'll go to the electric water pump that's over here. Now, like we told you guys, um, this water manifold has been, uh, was came with dash 16 AN lines and Martin decided to, you know, bore that out and then weld it on you know, aluminum piping and then smoothed out the inside. And that is one and a half inch um, hose. So that will be a much bigger, you know, surface area and volume for the water to flow. You'll know, get a lot better water flow, which will keep the car much cooler and will should work better. Um, now, one of the things that Martin usually does that we aren't doing on this car because a customer didn't provide that, is a lot of the times we'll have what's called a cross flow um, and it's a dual pass cross flow. So you'll have a split right here in the side so that the water when it goes in has to go across the top, go down, go across the bottom, and that way, you know, it has to cross through the entire radiator and you don't have, you know, one corner that doesn't get used quite as much as the rest of the radiator. Luckily, um, not having the dual pass cross flow shouldn't be that big of a deal because uh, this car is not going to see a lot of track use. It's mostly going to be a street car. It shouldn't be moving too fast and we'll have times in between going hard for it to get, you know, good airflow. Yeah, plus and, the V-mount setup, you get so much air through it that as long as he's driving. You know, as long as you're moving, you should have more than enough airflow and more than enough cooling. Uh, the dual pass isn't 100% necessary. Our system on the engine is pretty, typically pretty uh, simple. You know, obviously this is not anything like OEM, but we learn a lot of things from OEM cars, like, you know, like some of the high-end cars that Steve and I work on, and I get to learn from those cars. And also, you know, with all, our own experience of drifting and racing and stuff. Um, if you come closer. So we made a swirl tank. And this is a pretty common thing that people usually fabricate and, you know, put it on their race cars and drift cars. Uh, the whole idea is to have water circulating in this tank. And has a nice funnel in bottom at the end. So obviously this is water coming out of the engine. And then I usually build this completely away from the engine somewhere else, you know, it, depend, it depends on um, you know, how much room I get to work with. But this, since this packaging is so tight that I literally designed it to be right off the engine, um, ended up coming out pretty good. Um, this fitting will connect to the back of the engine. So the whole idea is to get some of the air out of the back of the engine into this. Um, this fitting connects to the turbo and goes down and into the radiator and back into the pump. And another, uh, another <clears throat> part that's really important on the water system is the water expansion tank, or if you want to call it overfill tank. Um, bottom of this will get connected to the top of the cap when the water system, when the pressure gets high, this will relieve some of the water in and out of the expansion tank. So it's basically, it's just our reservoir tank for this whole water system. <clears throat> when we get this car to run for the first time, you guys will see, we'll actually take this cap off and let the engine run with that cap off for a little while. We'll see the water swirling and allow the air bubbles to come out. Um, you wanna make sure that your engine is, does not have any air bubbles in the engine, otherwise you're gonna have overheating problems. So that's one of the first things. That's also why this is such a high point on the engine. You want that high because water, of course, is heavier than air. Water goes down, air goes up. So for the same reason, uh, we actually have the water pump mounted really low. Uh, we want the water pump mounted low so that when the car is running, the water sinks to the bottom and you have the best chance of the water pumping continuously and not getting air within the pump and not pumping properly. So that's going to be it for this video. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you guys kind of like these more talk heavy, you know, more in-depth videos, uh, comment down below and let me know. If you guys are a little bit more into the shorter, you know, faster paced video with a bit more music and all that kind of stuff, also let me know. And uh, we'll see you guys in the next one.